it's really exciting to have uh, you all here at Santa Clara, the site of our work. Um, and I would really like to make this more of a conversation since we're a small group and uh, many of you are real experts in HCI and some of you specifically in uh, augmented and virtual reality as well. So please do jump in uh, as I go through the material. I'd love to get your feedback. Uh, this is also really the first time that uh, I'm presenting outside of our university on this work. And so I'm really trying to get more feedback more widely from the community on directions that we might take this multi-year project. So Revealing Hidden Stories, co-designing the Tamian Ohlone Augmented Reality Tour is the subject of our talk. And as you'll see, um, it is about history in that the lands here have for thousands of years been stewarded by the Ohlone people of this region. Uh, but it's also about the contemporary situation in that these people are still here and there are collaborator, collaborators on this work. So we're here at the Mission Santa Clara. Now it's uh, quite dark, so you can't see the mission building, but it's uh, maybe two minutes over that way. Uh, one of the oldest buildings in California, of course, from when the Spanish settled here. Um, and our campus here is full of symbols and statues that recognize our rich Catholic tradition as a Jesuit university. Uh, so here's the cross at the site of the third Santa Clara mission. It's been, I think, burned down or earthquaked down three or four times. And so this is actually not the original mission, uh, but a reconstructed version of earlier versions that's actually been moved from previous sites. We have uh, a statue at the Adobe Lodge, a statue of Joseph, Maria, and Jesus that celebrates family. We have a statue of St. Ignatius, uh, and a beautiful statue of St. Clair of Assisi, the namesake of our city and our university. Um, and uh, there are, of course, many more that I don't have the time to, to share here. However, the story of um, the people here starts thousands of years ago before the Spanish colonizers and American settlers ever arrived on this land. And it starts with the Ohlone people who've stewarded this land for thousands of years. Uh, and if you look carefully, you can really see that that legacy of the Ohlone carries throughout the story of this land, but it's often overlooked in the official narrative on our campus. So many of the current monuments and markers really neglect or overlook or um, downplay the um, legacy and contemporary presence of Ohlone pe people in this region. But the Ohlone people are still here today. Here's Isabella Amne Gomez, who's our first Ohlone student at Santa Clara University and one of our collaborators on this project, actually. Uh, you can see here a map, one of the maps that, uh, showing the traditional territories of native or indigenous people in this area. Um, and you'll see that uh, Ohlone is generally the group that uh, populated these lands. Within that, it's sometimes subdivided into even sort of more distinct Ohlone subgroups. Ohlone was really a catch-all term that was applied to numerous groups with different uh, languages and identities, um, many of whom were fully decimated um, by the settlement of the Spanish and later Americans. And so our project then asks how we might use augmented reality to reveal this hidden story. Before I dive into talking about how we worked on that, I want to actually introduce what the tour is because uh, I find that when I say augmented reality, perhaps less so for you as an audience, people have all kinds of wild imaginations of what you're actually doing without concretely grounding it in some kind of use case um, and device and experience. So I wanna play a little video of what that actually looks like. Let me just turn my audio up. See if this works. Sounds 
Temple Santa Clara University departments partnered with Ohlone tribes once native to the land this campus is on to bring their stories to life for the use of augmented reality on cell phones. For thousands of years, our ancestors had Thalmian home. The Thalmian Ohlone AR tour transforms the SCU campus back to what it was thousands of years ago. Three stops on the tour were launched Monday, but soon visitors will be able to scan QR codes across campus to learn the stories that these tribe members want people to never forget. Akoi, Hoife, Thamian, Rowan. Welcome to the center of Thamian village. For thousands of years, our ancestors called Thamian home. Once an oak woodland with year round water sources, this village likely had 300 to 500 native inhabitants. Our people were forced to work long hours plowing fields, digging irrigation ditches, slaughtering cattle and constructing mission building, all to keep the mission system running. Some tribal members also held leadership positions as intermediaries between the native Californians and the Franciscan clergy. In recent years, our tribe collectively renamed the Mission Santa Clara Cemeteries in our ancestral Chochenyo language. In order to honor our ancestors buried here, the new name means where the Clarenio Indians are buried. The cemetery holds the remains of approximately 2,400 indigenous people out of the total 7,600 native individuals who are listed in the mission's burial records. Every year, this location right here, the St. Ignatius Lawn, becomes a vibrant hub for the powwow at Santa Clara University, featuring traditional food, music, and dance. Listen carefully and you can hear a sacred healing song in our Chichenyo language, as it was sung by the Sikhwan, our Ohlone ancestor, and recorded on a wax cylinder back in the 1930s. <laughs> So hopefully that gives you a flavor for what the actual experience is like. It's a mobile AR experience that is location-based and specific to our particular campus here. So far, we've launched four different stops. So each stop is, um, uses SLAM to localize to a uh, specific physical anchor in the location and then precisely locate content um, in the surrounding area that has a particular connection to that specific site. And so there's Tamian Village, uh, the Names in the Sky stop, the Mission Cemetery, the powwow, and then in one week, we're actually gonna be launching a new stop, which is all about basket weaving um, in conjunction with Indigenous Peoples Day, which is exciting. So I wanna talk a little bit about why we used augmented reality for this project, some of the co-design methods that we employed, as well as some general lessons for location-based um, augmented reality that have come out of this project. So why augmented reality? Well, um, the, uh, one of the, the major reasons is that we can design something that's actually rooted in our physical environment in a way that other formats are not necessarily so. So for background on this project, we had originally started on... Um, just, just as an example of how you might compare it, for a long time, people liked to make kiosks uh, to play, make in places so you could go to these kiosks and visit them. Just maybe want to, you know, compare the alternative ways of, of presenting, uh, you know, people sometimes with plaques on big steel stands and stuff. Yeah. So do you want to kind of compare those different modalities that people use for, for this kind of uh, commemoration just to kind of get, you know, to, to how did you choose this one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
You know, actually, we've also wanted to change some of the physical markers and signage on our campus. It's very controversial because we still have a lot of uh, Jesuit and Catholic legacy. And so recognizing this part of the history um, is an uphill battle. And so part of what we're attempting to do here is also prototype visions in working with this community of a more just future that are realized in the digital world first, but are perhaps prototypes what, for what could also be um, physical markers on the land. Um, of course, beyond that, the digital also opens up all sorts of interaction possibilities that just physically would not be able to be realized. I showed the Tamian village stop there, where you actually saw like the life-size Thule reed houses that you could walk into and see what the scene is like. We're planning a stop that will show um, recreations of uh, Ohlone dancers at that site. So these are things that are sort of interactive or multimedia in a way that would be difficult to communicate in a, a plaque at a particular site. Right, but I guess I guess I think of the trade-offs. So if yeah. you have a plaque there, anybody sees it when they walk by. When you have a kiosk there, anybody's intimidated by the computer when they walk by. Um, and you know, there, there's just been, there's a long history to these kind of things. And I just yeah. think that that that's an interesting question. And I mean, the affordances that you're you're creating, as you point out, have much richer or uh, exp you know, they can expand and they and and they um, have more possibilities. But I just just thought it was an interesting question. So. Yeah. So maybe another way of taking that is like the physical markers have much better discoverability in a way, right? To stumble upon the marker here, as opposed to like, if this lives in the ether because you have to go to the app store and download something, how do you have people find your experience in the first place? And uh, that's something that is really an unanswered question, to be honest, we're still figuring it out. Um, we're trying to work with the university to see if uh, at our museum on campus here, that way and at the uh, mission church itself, we might be able to install a little sign that has the QR code to download the experience because we get about 100,000 visitors a year to our campus, many of whom are mission tourists, many fourth graders. I did uh, fourth grade here in California myself and that's when you do a mission uh, history period. I made a mission out of marshmallows and toothpicks and many people still do that. Um, and then they many, many of them often come to our campus to see the mission and learn about that Catholic history. And wouldn't it be great if we could then also have some sort of a plaque or marker that says, you know, we know you came for the Catholic history, but we also want to show you this native um, story that um, you can access by um, this digital experience. So originally we actually started this project or my collaborators had started this project as a Google Earths map um, that documented this information about different sites on the campus. And then, uh, let's see if I can get rid of this. Well, I'll just try and put it here. Um, and then their initial thought was, why don't we create a virtual reality experience? And they were very excited about having, you know, like a eagle, which is one of the um, animals in the Ohlone creation story come flying you down into the campus and, and such. Um, and I think there's potential for that. But also when I joined the project two years ago, when I started here as an assistant professor, uh, I also thought that augmented reality is really a unique possibility on our campus because it's a site that attracts many visitors, because it's a site that has this rich cultural heritage. Uh, it's very you know walkable. Uh, it's a small university, there's no traffic. Um, so it's really an ideal test site for a lot of these kinds of location-based experiences that can be rooted in the physical environment. So that's what we wanted to explore. Yeah, Christopher. Roger, Kyle. Uh, one thing you can uh, think about is uh, the new generations of headsets like the uh, Oculus 3, and of course there's the Apple headset, are both AR and VR. Yep. So now that you have both capabilities on device, you could walk up to a, a hut in AR. Then if you want to click a button and now you see it in VR, so you see the whole scene. You can just uh, go back and forth. So you don't have to make a choice between either one. You can mm. support both. Yeah, actually we're exploring uh, how this could work on 
headsets, um, mostly see-through AR right now is what we're, which are less mature in a way, but uh, getting there. They're pretty fancy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's one of the things that I want. So oh, cool. You can pretty much put on a headset and have to take it off. All right. Well, so, yeah. So that's that's probably what's next. Uh, we've only explored the, the mobile AR form factor right now, and then we're exploring what's next in terms of pass through or see through AR um, and how we can realize that that experience as well. Because there also, I think, needs to, like, there needs to be some different um, interactions there as well in terms of how the user is going to navigate the experience relative to what we currently have, which is a map view. Um, so we're, we're starting to think about that. Yeah. So there's, of course, the well-known virtual uh, virtuality continuum by Milgram and uh, Kishino. Uh, that talks about virtual reality on sort of one extreme where you're entirely immersed in an experience and then physical reality on the other. And then there's a lot of this sort of in-between space, if you will, between augmented virtuality um, and head-mounted displays and then going towards augmented reality, um, including optical and video see-through. Uh, and so we're much more on this sort of uh, side towards reality where we're blending the physical and virtual worlds. Um, another understanding here can be um, reality media, which was put forward by Engberg and Volter, and talks about media forms that redefine our perspective of lived experience and of the spaces which we physically inhabit. And I think that's really the sense in which we're exploring AR here, is a way of redefining the perspective of the, the site that all of us at Santa Clara University spend time on every day, um, and many members of our community also then visit. Cameron and Fitzpatrick have three levels of spatial attunement in location-based AR, um, starting from overwriting, where the experience is really pervasive around the world and somewhat templated, so you get the same experience no matter where you go. Uh, tethering, which is site-specific and mostly brand-motivated, and rooting, which is site and community-specific. And so that's really the, the level at which we're aiming to develop a location-based AR experience. One example of overriding would be Pokemon Go, of course, which is probably the world's most popular augmented reality experience at this point in time. Uh, but really there, the environment is secondary to what's happening in the game. You want to be able to access Pokemon anywhere you go around the world. Um, and they don't really adapt to, if you're in a graveyard, you're not going to get graveyard Pokemon. Or in water, you're not going to get sort of water Pokemon. So you could imagine doing things like this, but rather what they're doing is more just finding an open canvas and then trying to fix it, uh, place their uh, virtual assets into any space that you know, meets basic criteria. Tethering would be sort of site-specific and brand motivated. And the example that they give is a guided walking tour of six AR art pieces that started at select Apple stores around the world, which was a collaboration between a New York Museum and uh, Apple. Uh, oh, and this should be then uh, rooting. And here an example um, of something that's both site specific and engaged with a very particular community would be Kinfolk AR, which is a recent project that aims to work with black communities to reimagine the monuments in their neighborhoods. Um, so for instance, here in New York City, they came together and imagined um, uh, Toussaint, um, Le, I cannot pronounce this name uh, very well. <laughs> oh, Overture, okay. Um, the leader of a Haitian slave rebellion um, as a digital replacement to a statue of Christopher Columbus there. So another possibility here is to envision a more just future. Um, the work is inspired in part by a project at Stanford University where they did a project to recognize Chanel Miller, a sexual assault survivor. Um, and they created this experience uh, to display a plaque here in augmented reality um, that Chanel had wanted on a monument and that Stanford University refused to print um, on that monument. Um, however, soon after the university actually did end up installing a physical plaque at the location that was nearly identical to the AR one. Um, so in a way then, 
the augmented reality served as kind of an advocacy platform to galvanize a community and advocate for what they eventually also wanted um, as a physical change to the campus. And so similarly, our hope is that uh, we would eventually have some kind of physical markers recognizing the Ohlone presence here as well. So you could imagine here at one of the oldest sites on our campus by the original adobe wall of one of the former um, mission churches that we could have, for instance, a statue of Ohlone dancers, which is something that the tribe has discussed. Uh, but at the moment, that's going to be a heavy lift with our university administration. And so we could envision something like that starting in augmented reality as a prototype. In fact, the Ohlone Working Group, which um, issued its recommendations uh, now about four years ago, made a series of recommendations to this effect, a few of which have been implemented, but many of which have not yet. And part of the motivation for our project is then that this is based on the work of scholars and the Ohlone community. And what can we take from this and envision in augmented reality and advocate for as a potential in physical reality eventually as well. Um, of course, there's a motivation to reach more people. So another motivation for this project is the race and slavery walking tour at the University of Alabama, where Hillary N. Green gives a walking tour of how that campus was built in large part by slave labor, which is not something that you're going to get on the official walking tour of the University of Alabama. Uh, but because she's Hillary Ann Green, one woman, she can only offer this tour a few times a year. And so um, by offering it through augmented reality, we also hope that we can scale projects like this one um, and eventually offer guidance to sites beyond our own based on the lessons that we're able to learn from doing this work here. Um, and finally, of course, I think as um, Christopher was suggesting, there's already a lot of technology that could facilitate different form factors, uh, as well as a rapid improvement curve here. Um, and so we're currently building actually with Lightship VPS technology uh, created by Niantic, which they use for Pokemon Go, but we use them for more of a serious storytelling purpose. Um, they have a world mapping service and a visual positioning system that we can use as a platform to locate um, digital assets in the, in the environment. Um, if we want to go way back, we can think about very early sort of augmented reality systems like the Mars backpack system for location-based AR. Um, fortunately, you no longer need to carry around a backpack to do augmented reality. We have a lot more uh, accessible form factors, although there's still a ways to go. Of course, there's the Microsoft HoloLens, um, and then most recently also Meta Orion uh, on the see-through side. I didn't include here, but there's also you know, a lot of pass-through options as well that um, could be used for augmented magic reality. Leap. Well, Yep, yeah, magic. So we're actually exploring uh, the Magic Leap potentially as a headset because they have a beta program with um, Niantic, the current platform that we're building on to do um, this kind of slam localization for assets. So. But I'm, I'm very platform agnostic. I'm not married to any particular platform here. It's really about delivering the experience via whatever platform will allow us to tell the best um, and most fitting story. Uh, and I think in the future, we will really have mass market augmented reality headsets. Um, I don't know exactly what that time frame is, but it, we're certainly heading in that direction. I'll talk a little bit also about the co-design methods that. Um, we have been using on this tour. So in my past work, I've done a lot of work actually on digital well-being and how people can manage their time and attention on social media, as well as how those platforms can be redesigned um, so that instead of having a lot of attention capture dark patterns, they're designed to support the way that people want to spend their time and attention on these services. And in that work, I've used what I would call more common or traditional HCI systems research methods. So it typically looks something like understanding, using interviews or experience sampling, then a process of design um, and building and evaluating. Uh, and I've published in all of these domains. Of course, it's never really that linear. That's kind of the neat story. But often, it looks something more like this, where you start by understanding something, and then you try and build something. You say, that really does not work. And you have to go back to doing some more understanding. But that was kind of the neat picture. Um, and now stepping into this project two years ago when I joined here at Santa Clara University, I've really had to adjust a little bit about how I approach, uh, well, actually, let me talk about maybe uh, the contributions of the HCI systems. 
research. So there it would typically be that you know, you're using a lot of known techniques oftentimes for your code, but you're combining things in novel or interesting ways. And then also studying the empirical understanding of the interaction between um, the system and users. So, so that's been sort of historically where I came from in ETI, but now moving into this world of uh, a deeply co-designed project has required me to um, make some adjustments. I no longer, you know, for this project, think of the user as a commodity. So I used to do a lot of studies, or I still do some studies, um, where the users come from prolific or mTurk, and you can kind of, it's one off, right? You can swap them in or out for a particular use case uh, or a particular study and then go on to the next study. In this one, it's really deeply grounded in a particular community. And so the co-design has to recognize that. Um, and in particular, it's now a years long relationship with the Ohlone Native American tribe uh, and its members. Um, for me, it's several years um, doing co-design where there's kind of this nothing about us without us approach, um, participatory design. Um, we also draw from design justice by Sasha Costanza Shock now um, and try and avoid some of the top down design that historically has been used. Yeah. So did you talk about the co-design being with the Indians, but I keep hearing that you're at Santa Clara University and there's the Jesuits. And um, do you want to say something about, are you, you know, fending off those other people or are they part of the co-design too? Because um, these, you know, and probably, I don't know, Santa Clara, the the, you know, even even the, the city might be involved. I don't know what what, what all uh, the co-design feels like or what would be, do you have to focus first on one community or is it better to be bringing in all of them? That's a great question. So we have approached it by definitely prioritizing the Ohlone voices on the project. Um, so they're really kind of our, we have sort of three key personas, if you will, that we tend to focus on. Um, our Ohlone partners are really our VIP um, stakeholders in this project, and um, they're the voices that we most want to focus on because um, I think their voices are the most neglected in this scenario. Then we also have sort of a campus community persona, if you will, uh, and that includes also our Jesuit members, um, as well as the students and other you know, uh, members who belong to our Santa Clara University community. Um, and then finally, we also have uh, mission tourists because we get a lot of mission tourists coming to Santa Clara about, yeah, about 100,000 a year. Um, and so we also then want to make sure that the experience is approachable to that audience in a way that uh, doesn't immediately um, get them to sort of tune out, if you will, um, but rather can engage them um, productively in a conversation about some of also the dark or troubling history that they might not be aware of or be expecting when they come to the uh, Mission Church site here. Yeah, go ahead. Just, uh, just a, a little bit of a question into that similar topic. Um, I can imagine as for example, the um, H. Green example. Yeah. Uh, there are constituencies involved, stakeholders involved where <clears throat> Some folks might have a particular bent on that history and others have a different one. And there's conflicting constraints, if you will. Um, is that the sort of thing that you're looking at when you're you, when you point out that um, the Jesuits and some of the um, administration here versus some of the other voices? Like, is that the sort of like whose story gets told is that part of the question is that's that part definitely of the part of the question yes yeah. uh it's definitely a contested story right mm -hmm. and i think our perspective um as a co-design team is that the um catholic tradition is very richly represented on our university campus and the native history and story is largely neglected on our campus so we're not I would say viewpoint agnostic or neutral, if you will, which I mean, in the first place, I think that's kind of a myth as to you know, how you would go about designing technology in the first place. But yeah, we definitely have a perspective here that um, uh, is grounded also more so in the work of my colleagues, um, who I'll introduce in a minute, who are in anthropology and English, who have collaborated with the tribe for, uh, in Lee's case, several decades now. Um, and 
then there's a lot to navigate there in terms of how these stories get told and represented and who's doing the storytelling. Um, but we've yeah, consciously chosen in this case to foreground um, the Ohlone voices here in the story that we're telling. Uh, yeah, so it's been a process of building relationships with Ohlone leaders. Um, here's a picture of us at one of our launch events last year. Um, our Moek Maloney collaborators here include Gloria Gomez, Monica Ariano, who are really into um, preserving the Chechenyo language of the Ohlone people. And so one future version of the tour we're planning to do as a Chechenyo language version, um, not just an English language version as well. Uh, and then uh, more recently, we've also involved a lot of youth from the tribe in the project, which has been fascinating in the sense that some of the tribal elders have fantastic stories. And as soon as we start talking about the technology, we want to run away. Uh, and the youth, by contrast, oftentimes are very excited to uh, get into our HDI lab and start playing around with the different cameras and technologies. And so we've been leading actually a co-design session. Every two weeks, my students lead a co-design session with um, uh, Georgiana and Lucas right now on designing uh, just showing them like what we're currently working on, whether that's like scanning for the mesh for a particular new site that we want to use as an anchor to do slam localization um, or storyboarding some of the different stops and ideas that we have or creating 3D models. <clears throat> and then uh, on the Santa Clara University side, uh, we have a really interdisciplinary team, um, myself in computer science, Amy in English, Lee in anthropology and Danielle in art. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, this project is really only possible because Lee um, and Amy have really been working with the Ohlone people for, in Lee's case, decades. And I think Amy now maybe six years or so. And they have this relationship of trust to be able to tell the story um, together with them in a way that I think if I were just approaching this as a new computer science guy at Santa Clara University almost certainly would not be possible. Um, and so that's been really, really unique and rewarding to step into that since joining here two years ago. Um, and then we've got students involved from, I think about seven different majors at the moment. So a few of the lessons that we've learned in augmented reality, one is to be upfront about some of our limitations, both like what are the limitations in the field and then what are our limitations as a team you know, where students are doing most of the work uh, on the day-to-day -day basis of actually developing out this experience. Uh, so initially we had for that village stop, for instance, an image that we would have a river flowing through and we would have um, lots of 3D models moving around and a coyote and children. Um, and we just found that uh, that was more modeling and uh, more than the technical experience that we were using at the time was able to support. So at the time we were doing web AR and running things in the browser turned out to be not that stable. Um, we've since shifted to Unity. And so I think it actually opens up a lot of these possibilities in a native app where we can store um, more assets on the device itself. Um, and so we're now just starting to explore some of this again. But um, at the time when we got started two years ago, that was sort of beyond our capabilities. And we had to realize that like, we want to have bold visions for what's possible. But at the same time, this isn't purely a research project in the sense that we also have a promise to our community partners here that we're going to deliver something that they can show to their community. And when they you know, come to campus in a week, that we'll have their actual stop that they envisioned um, in some uh, actually working in some meaningful way. So you, hello. Yeah. yeah, you asked for questions. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, first say that I'm Ted and when people speak, please remind us of who you are. Um, also, I want to say that there's a lot more people online than there are in the room, just so you know. How wonderful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, this, this question of meaningful, um, I want to know what, well, you know, you've been thinking about evaluation metrics, I'm sure, all the way through. You started off in the CHI community. You know all about evaluation. Tell us about evaluation in, in a situation where you're delivering it to people that think that, you know, that 
that have various purposes uh, of outreach and, and promotion, and you're sitting there trying to find out if this thing is actually effective. How do you figure out if it's effective? Yeah, so to be honest, we're only starting on that right now in terms of evaluation of the end user experience. And I think the way that we're thinking about it is in terms of those uh, different personas or constituencies that um, we've been working with. So one of those is the tribe. Like, is this like accurately telling the story that they'd want to share with the world? And um, I think there, um, that's often derived through our co-design process. So we have regular co-design meetings with them and then um, have them come to campus and actually uh, do observations when they go through the experience to evaluate their, their um, reactions. I'm not going to harp on this, but I guess I'm just going to you know, think, you know, I, I tend to be quantitative. Yep. And so I want to find out, did people come away learning more about them, uh, feeling differently about the tribe, uh, people yep. that had no experience before? I guess that's, you know, I, that, I'm, I'm, I'm hunting for that kind of uh, data. Yeah, so that's the direction we're going with the um, fourth graders who come to campus, which is a more scalable way of delivering our tour. We're currently in talks with uh, the museum on campus because they give like often dozens of tours a week to fourth grade classes coming here. Um, and we're currently thinking about issuing a series of iPads to them and then the students can go out and have it preloaded on an iPad. And uh, we could have sort of a before and after survey. We're working with our educational Office of Educational Assessment to develop an instrument that would measure some sense of uh, what were their impressions of the Ohlone people before um, they went through this experience and then subsequently. So that would be sort of the most hanging fruit that we're targeting. And, right and I, I would like to hope that there would be a baseline that's the best of breed alternative. So you could test whether it was this, what was the aspect that made it work? Yeah, it's interesting. What, what would you suggest as a potential baseline? Like one thing would be to give them nothing or to do the traditional tour without the AR experience. You know, those are you possibilities. Could that put all considering. the same assets on a, on, a, on a three ring binder that they can flip through and walk around. Everybody has a three ring binder they're walking around with. Yeah. You know, that's an example. I don't know if that's the best breed. Yeah. You know, one has to think it through. Yeah. Edwin, I think, has a... Has a hey, yes, this is Edwin. Um, just a thing from a... An experience as a traveler, less as an HCI professional. Obviously. Absolutely. Um, but in traveling different uh, cities, I've had the, you know, I've used an app w that was GPS aware and had landmarks built in and recorded like audio information that would be, that could be done. You could run through it as an organized walking tour following a path that it provided you. Mm -hmm but it was also capable of like just noting wherever you are and just saying, hey, on your right, there's this, and on your left, there's this thing that you might wanna hear about. Um, I feel like that's that was super fun for me as a, as a traveler. Yeah. Um, and I feel like there could definitely be some like overlap with what, the, what you're working on here. Yeah. Yeah, I love like the audio guides at museums or different historical sites. Um, so could, that could be another possibility, right? To compare it to an audio, a pure audio guide or something that's in just that form factor as well. Yep. Uh, another interesting lesson in augmented reality is that we're using um, SLAM. So uh, you actually need to create a mesh of a particular physical object in the environment. Uh, which then uh, is what the camera looks to detect in order to recognize that Ellie's at this particular location here. And so we should show her um, the objects in this constellation around her. Um, and so you can see here, initially we had as an anchor this distinctive Bannon family mall for uh, a prototype of the uh, Tomian village stop. And it was an interesting case where the uh, feedback that we got from that was um, that that particular thing, although it was a technical, technically appealing anchor in that it was visually distinctive and was able to locate the, uh, geoloc geolocate the assets accurately, um, was problematic in terms of the message that it conveyed and that we didn't want to have the Ohlone village brought to you by the Bannon family, 
as grateful as we are to the Bannon family for their donations to Santa Clara University. And so then really thinking through what was conveyed by the particular objects in the physical environment that we used to anchor the augmented reality experiences on was something that we started to think through more as we proceeded. Another challenge um, on that sort of co-design front uh, is one of finding the right basket together with the community. And so we also started in that prototype with baskets that we pulled from Sketchfab. Um, so from other indigenous communities or even from other Ohlone communities, but it wasn't the Mwakma Ohlone communities. And so then it really had to be a basket that was um, created by a member of their um, particular group rather than sort of a neighboring group. And uh, we actually were exploring for a while, going to the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, which has one of these baskets, getting access to um, the baskets at UC Davis. And eventually we settled on a solution of actually working with a tribal member who created a basket for us, for this experience that we've now uh, scanned in 3D and then can display inside of the tour for the stop that's launching in a week. Uh, and I think this really connects to this message of nothing about us without us that comes from the disability community um, in that when you're going through this process of telling a story that's not your story or not my story, um, you really need to partner with the community that's affected. Um, and in this case, the primary community whose story we see as uh, being told here is the Ohlone community. And so they're integral partners and will tell us when we found the right basket and help us get there. So, uh, you know, sometimes in tech, we have this ethos of move fast and break things. And uh, this is decidedly not one of those projects. Um, perhaps if you're designing a, a casual game, um, that's okay. But um, there are some other projects like this one where that's not the right ethos. And so every asset that we put into the AR tour is very deliberate in the sense that um, the background music is something that we um, recorded together with the tribe. We did a we booked a recording studio and had them all come and sing their traditional songs. Um, and what was wonderful about that is not only is it an asset that we can use in the augmented reality tour, but it's also an asset that they own and um, can use in their own community. And so when they appeared at a San Jose Earthquakes game, they played that over the loudspeakers there and have been able to you know, record that for posterity as well. Yeah. Um, MS, who I'm not sure who that is, is asking great, interesting questions. Uh, what is your thinking, perhaps, justifications for personas as one of the building blocks in the guiding tool of design? Yeah, I think for us to clarify which audiences we're designing for, and then also recognize that it's not just reach as many users as possible, but there's actually a prioritization here as well, right? in that the Ohlone stakeholders here, uh, their voices count times 100 or times 1,000, in that if the story isn't accurate to what they want to share, then we're not getting it right. So the follow-up question was, or statement was, uh, you know, the quantities are only meaningful to those people uh, that is being designed for. And you, you, you've made that point in many, many ways here, but that was just uh, the same person who had commented on that. And finally, um, uh, you know, is academic mastery a stated goal of the community uh, put at the center? That's a question. Yeah, so that's an interesting question because beyond co-design, are there are particular types of co-design like participatory action research that really involve members of the community in not just sort of the design of an artifact or experience, but in determining which research questions get asked in the first place. And Monica and Gloria, two of the uh, collaborators of ours on this project have actually co-published a lot of anthropological writings or publications with Lee uh, and Amy. I think for them, and I think that's actually Monica's background as well. And so she's very interested and knowledgeable in that field. I think for them, HCI is more of a new field. And so, so far, I think I'd love to get them more involved in setting out what some of our research questions are, particularly on the co-design side, like what co-design methods work for them as a community. Um, but the, the 
place where I think that's actually been the most fruitful so far has been with the youth actually, to really see how, how they engage with the experience and what questions they have about how this technology can and cannot represent the stories in their community. And there was a, a request to, to unmute and ask a question. I'm not sure if that's gonna happen. Let's see. And Matt, are you gonna ask a question? <laughs> Great. Hi. Thanks. Just had to tap the right thing. Um, if I know we well, if it comes through in the chat, uh, happy to respond. He, I know we have he is on. in on the Zoom, but oh, I don't. Okay. If we're not hearing it in the room, that's yeah. a different thing. I tried a question in the chat. Can yes. Okay. Can? Please. We now can hear you. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. This is terrific. Thank you. Um, my work is in product design, digital design on the experience side and research. And um, I know we have only limited time for each question. I'd like to hear a little bit more uh, Kai in response to my question. What's your thinking for using personas as part of your design pro or process? And what would be the alternative maybe? Not using them and using actual people uh, as let's, let's listen to Kai's as question. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, I think we. I see personas here as a communication tool for our team, in that we have four different faculty from different disciplines. We've got twelve students from seven different departments, and. Uh, then, of course, our Ohlone collaborators. And setting out those personas achieves some alignment for us in terms of it's a currency that everyone can easily understand and latch onto across these different disciplines and allows us to then say, who are we building this story for and who are we prioritizing and who are we not prioritizing in the way that we tell these stories? Alternatives um, could be like, mindset personas. So rather than basing them on sort of demographics, you can think about like uh, more, perhaps there's people who are newcomers to AR. And so you could classify people according to, on different dimensions. In our case, we did choose kind of these three buckets of uh, Ohlone tribal members um, and what they want to get out of the AR tour, um, campus community members, particularly students, and then um, who, who have expressed an interest in Ohlone history, but limited knowledge of it. Uh, and then finally, mission tourists who are coming to see the mission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, yeah, thanks for, thanks for chiming in. Appreciate it. Uh, and so then we've also been thinking about, in collaboration with these communities, what are some of the co-design methods that we can use to envision what the AR tour can look like and how it might be developed in the future? Uh, and so one of the things that we've been exploring has been what we're calling landmark-based affinity diagramming. So affinity diagramming being a very common um, technique in uh, HCI or interaction design, where you will have post-its for all of the different sort of findings or possibilities for a particular product or service. And then you wanna put them up on a big wall or a big board and cluster them. And in this case, we printed out a giant map of our campus, which is really our canvas for this project because everything really wants to respond to this why here question. And then we took um, post-it notes in, uh, I think yellow or uh, pink there were, let's see, our um, messages or stories that we wanted to share. And then the blue post-it notes were the assets, so the digital assets that we had um, to share in, this, in the tour. So those could be 3D models, videos, um, or other possibilities that could be richly envisioned um, as being located at a particular site. So this was our process of then um, using some of these models in, or, or envisioning where these models should go. And so many of these 3D models um, also come from objects that have been found um, or excavated here on the campus. Uh, the anthropologist on the project, Lee, is also an archeologist and has doing or leading a lot of digs actually, where they found, for instance, that where we have the Tamian village there is 
actually very close to the site where the village would have stood um, historically. And so that's why we chose to represent it there. And they found arrowheads and other objects there that we can show as 3D models inside of the experience there. So a few, I'll conclude with a few open questions that we have um, as we go forward with this work and would love to get your feedback on. Uh, one is like, how do we approach co-design with tribal youth? Um, I think that's been an interesting and at times sort of challenging uh, thing to do, particularly as we're doing it remotely um, with these youth and um, figuring out how to engage them in these different projects at an appropriate level has been interesting. Uh, and then secondly, how might we create a AR toolkit that empowers educators and storytellers to create social justice tours at different sites or different cultural heritage sites um, in our area or around the world? So what resources do others need or what might be learned from our experience that others can then um, draw upon to create similar experiences? And then finally, you know, what are new interactions that we might explore that are rooted in the physical environment? And so we're just, right now it's been mostly overlaying content on top of what you're actually seeing um, through the camera view. And we're just, with our new stop, starting to explore a little bit about you know, being able to then tap on that content and manipulate that content um, through the affordances of mobile AR. And going forward, then we're interested in how that can play out when we move to other form factors like AR headsets, um, which would require a different type of modal, multimodal interaction, um, likely gesture and voice. Um, well, um, those are great questions, um, Ted Selker. I, I, you know, I'm sure that other people will have a lot to say and ask, and please keep the questions coming online. Um, but um, I, you know, um, some people talk about mixed reality being when you can't tell the relationship between uh, what isn't there and what is there. The kind of you know, whole whole ends mm -hmm. and, and magic leap, and 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 also the new. Uh, Quest yeah. things that we deal with that and augmented reality when you have some symbolic uh, information that's overlaid over the world it might be text um, and I kind of put your imagery in that camp and then there's virtual reality where you don't have anything from the outside world yeah. so that that's that's a taxonomy that I'm I'm familiar with but mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering what you want to say about you've got this uh, this imagery that's obviously um, computer generated, mm -hmm. and you could imagine obliterating the campus and it looking like a field and hearing the chirp, the sounds of the great bear, the great uh, California bear that used to be around here and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and I almost wonder, is it, what do you think about the, is there some value to having that sound stage that is obviously an indoor sound stage where the music's being made? Mm -hmm. um, and is there value to having these kind of, uh, VR, you know, handmade graphical things, and how does that compare with trying to inundate, you know, to immerse a person in, you know, 18, uh, 1700 uh, uh, experiences? I think that was also a little bit what Christopher was getting at, and that you could have not just the like small subset of objects that we're currently displaying in the environment, but you could create the entire environment and sort of toggle on and off, like how richly immersed you are in that whole digital environment versus just you know, having sort of augmented overlays on specific parts of it. Um, I think it's an interesting proposition. I would love to explore it actually and see what it would be like uh, to also, are we doing this like physically in the location or is this now like a VR thing where you can do it from your living room? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I would imagine if it's in like a sort of, um, phone format right now, it's hard to totally immerse the user in our current format because you always have the wider view of like what's actually going on, right? But Maybe you're like revealing things as you're looking around. So there's a lot of value in the way, I mean, not completely immersing. Mm -hmm. Although I push against it and want the whole thing. <laughs> but what's good about it is you're oriented. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not gonna bump into people. You're not gonna, you're gonna be with your friend out here at Santa yeah. Clara campus. You're going to be with your, your, your teachers over there. The bus is behind you. That's right. Um, and so I, you know, that's why I kind of asked the question. I see. Um, yeah. But I, don't, I, I want to make sure other people get to ask questions. I'll probably have yeah. I, I think it certainly wouldn't work if you're trying to wear like a uh, head mounted display and then 
completely immersed in yeah walking walking around in the environment here because there's too many bikes and other things going on at the same time so you'd have to navigate that i mean that that's a big difference between the apple one and the um and the magic leap absolutely uh yep. the magic leap it cannot uh cover up brightness right yep. it's out there in the world where the apple one you can you know it is manufactured inside and so can pretend yep. that it can make even it a uh, even if it's see-through. Um, yeah, so I think I really like the question number one. Oh, my name is Sanika. <laughs> uh, so I was thinking about this as you were showing your designs. Uh, am I speaking in the mic? Um, this actually is like a really good starting point to now as you're uh, exploring, having interactions with the, with the display, with the uh, your experience uh, with everything that the user sees that now they can leave a feedback or maybe leave a note and it could now become a social interaction kind of thing because mm. I think the the key value uh, proposition in this whole use this project is the target audience it's very very um, focused it's not general it's not for everyone so if I'm interested in certain area certain topic I can then connect with others who are maybe interested in that or maybe it would be nice, like a nice touch point for more social getting more socially uh, uh, yeah involved in in that in that area so that was my thinking so tribal youth uh, i think today's youth is so fast so in their phones they want a social interaction but they want it through technology so this, this would also open gates for that so i was thinking about these things yeah, thank you. Uh, at dinner, Ellie and I were actually talking about a project that uh, she had worked on at Northwestern, where similarly there was like a, tell me if I'm getting this right, but a campus tour, and they were also exploring this concept of like being able to leave messages, like a visitor book, if you will, um, and then being able to see messages that others have left behind after going through the experience. Um, and I think there's something there. Figuring out exactly what the right interaction is is tricky. Like we were talking about how it's compelling to probably leave a message. Do I want to like listen to all of them or like which ones do we highlight or show? Another intriguing possibility is actually that the um, tribe has some stories that they don't want to share. We're gonna get it's gonna get I guess they're locking we, we us now in here. Have the, the curtains are closing in this room as we're <laughs> So the tribe has some stories that they don't actually want to share publicly. And so we could imagine actually having some sort of special code or login for just tribal members where they're able to communicate some of these stories at different sites, um, which would be a really interesting affordance that we could make possible inside of the app. Yeah. Oh, do you want to munch, talk about that a little bit or not? I typed a question in the chat. Right. Um, this is uh, Ellie Burgess, um, and yeah, so back when I was an undergrad, we were extremely excited to use Google Glass. It was the hottest thing, <laughs> and um, uh, we were thinking about all sorts of exciting things, like what if we did like a Chicago gangster tour and could like overlay old like newspaper clippings on Chicago, and then we're like, okay. But honestly, for a class, what, what's, <laughs> what can we actually do? And so we called it Spectacle. Um, it smelled like the glasses. <laughs> and uh, we, um, we thought, well, a self-guided Northwestern tour would be intriguing and you know, scoped appropriately for class. And so um, we, we used different uh, landmarks as well. I don't know. We used, uh, I think we used a slightly different system, um, but some of the ideas were um, within the virtual spaces after it would play information about the, um, the particular landmark. So like the Northwestern Arch is very iconic, for instance, or during library, um, it would read it out cut, and then you could scroll through it on the little um, eyepiece of the Google Glass, um, but we found that uh, it saying it out loud was a little easier of an interaction more interesting so you could look around while you're hearing it um, and then we had um, what we called footprints where you could 
believe would prompt people to take pictures in uh, especially in different seasons because northwestern is very iconic in the winter in the fall, things like that, um, especially as a student kind of thinking about, okay, it's gorgeous right now here in the summer. <laughs> what will it look like in Chicago winter? <laughs> um, and then also um, to leave audio recordings. Um, and so I think there's intriguing possibilities there, but like the guy and I were, were talking about, it's also, you know, what is useful to have as like patina of other people. Um, and I think we were still thinking about that when we closed the project. So it's an ongoing question. I wanted to make a little comment. I thought it was good for you to bring up the comment about uh, Ted Selker again, uh, about the, um, the, the, the teaching the kids are including the kids. And I think that they're, you know, in a way it's gonna be a circle where the elders are gonna teach you and the kids aren't as well versed in this history and them getting interested in it might come through the product that you're making. Um, and, and the question is how do you, you know, maybe you can use it to re-engage them in their cultures. I think kind of maybe one of the things you're thinking about, is that right? Yeah, a hundred percent. We'd love to um, get them engaged in also, you know, recognizing that these stories are not just histories, but they're living stories that need to be retold and reimagined and adapted for contemporary times and contemporary medium uh, mediums. So uh, that's really what we're exploring together with them. And, uh, you know, then we hope that also they can uh, bring their perspective into a technology industry that really needs more diverse voices. Edwin? Hey, um, just a just a spark that happened in my head as we were just going through that discussion is I'm, I'm a long ways out of grad school, but um, I feel like I remember a whole set of like research around the term annotation, how hmm. it's, uh, how annotation is helpful, the kinds, the things that make it useful, helpful. And it strikes me that this is a matter of like, could be seen as as a matter of annotating the world somehow um that, that's yeah there's I, a researcher at right there. Uh, google rofe du who um has done a, a couple of projects where it's really about adding social annotations to the real world that you can then you know view as you go through the world um and so you can tag everything from like what you liked at a restaurant to you know uh, fond memories from a particular bench or things like this. And I think there's, yeah, some possibility of like potentially having visitors to the tour engage in some format of that. Um, we'd have to be careful about like seeing what's appropriate to the stakeholders that we have in this project. Um, and particularly then, you know, highlighting perhaps the Ohlone voices in those annotations as well. So a guy named Jim Sporer wrote a patent uh, when he was at Apple on that topic about 1993. Um, and the um, Bose um, audio system uh, uh, was kind of wonderful. And you'd walk around Austin and it tells you about the buildings that you're next to, the history right. and so on. This annotation idea goes back even farther. I mean. Steve, uh, Steve Feiner was working on this do yeah. dozens of years ago, uh, especially for archaeological, uh, archaeological sites. Um, so that's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a long heritage um, of, of that sort. Um, I wanted to bring up and ask a question if any of you guys have ever experienced the kind of thing that I experienced at the um, uh, Music Experience Museum in Seattle, uh, where they made uh, augmented, um, um, basically um, guides that you would put on these earphones and go through their, their exhibits. Actually, there was nothing visual. It was all audio. Mm -hmm. But what I found was there were two museums. And one museum you go through and you learn all about it by standing and staring and looking at the little plaques and talking to your friends. And the other one you go through with the audio and you're all by yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's dragging you through the, the, its story. And I guess the question is, how do, how do, we, how do we titrate? How do we, just, how do we make it so that, what, what do you do about the engagement with the physical world, with people around you, and, the, and this annotated world that we're creating? Um, 
because that one in, in, in computer history, uh, music museum, I don't know if any of you guys have played with it. It was lovely in a very abstract and lonely way. Yeah, I actually went to that museum. Uh, you know the story I'm telling a, you a little bit? Or not? Uh, when I was a PhD student at UW and uh, had a similar experience where my wife and I went there together, but it felt like I could have gone there alone because it was so sort of, you know, isolating in a way that that uh, form factor cut you off from sort of the others in your environment. One of the things that actually we're curious about, um, I mentioned that we're working with the museum here and their docents to potentially do a augmented reality dosing guided sort of experience and seeing how social interactions there are shaped by adding in augmented reality, whether it sort of diminishes the experience of you know, social interaction together with the docent and amongst the fourth graders who come to campus. So one possibility that we're thinking about is deliberately not purchasing iPads for everyone, but having two or three students share a single iPad so that they kind of have to collaborate and huddle around and then have discussions about the experience rather than all being in their own worlds on their own device. Um, and I'd be really curious to do a comparison study there. Sounds, uh, that sounds like a really good experiment. Yeah. All right, this is Ellie Bridges again. So I'm curious if you've run into any issues with sunshine. Um, I know you're using, yeah, because I'm thinking you're outside California. Um, I know with Google Glass, just to, given the way it, it had the little screen on it, you could not see it outside. So you'd have to wear like a brimmed hat. Now you're mm. using like phones and stuff uh, and, and, and iPads, but I still wonder if you get glare or if you could tell us anything about your experiences there so far. Yeah, I can tell you like last week, I like, even if the glare weren't an issue, didn't want to be out in, uh, you know, 100 plus degree weather doing this experience, right? So there's both like, how do we get the devices to work in different environments as well as like, does anyone actually want to use it? Um, and you can't use it now, you know, it's not going to uh, be able to do slam localization in the dark, actually. Um, and so there are a lot of limitations that come also with trying to create something like, like this um, that has to recognize objects in the environment. Uh, I would say that ours is a pretty ideal environment in the sense that like when it's raining, people really don't want to do this experience and be waving their phones around. Um, and so we've encountered that from time to time, but it's pretty rare here. And so, you know, most of the time you have great weather for this sort of an experience. Uh, the best is a slightly cloudy day, I would say. Um, when you get that direct glare, I would say it's doable, but definitely sometimes you have to squint and you don't want to get sort of blinded when the phone takes a particular angle. I think we also need to test it out with some of the different um, headsets. Uh, I think particularly with the see-through AR, it's a challenge with really bright light because uh, um, the uh, technology inside of the glasses, sometimes that's, you know, there's different formats, but you know, yeah, if it's a... This is Chris Perry. So yeah. uh, with the uh, Apple device, the Pro device, it, uh, it's ISO adjusts based on brightness. Yeah. So it'll handle it. And then there's low light uh, compensation systems. I think the Quest will have it on the next one. Uh, Apple, I think, has it. And other devices that will have see-through, they will all have uh, more advanced camera and shading algorithms to kind mm -hmm. of handle that to a point. <laughs> Obviously, you stare at the sun. Okay, that was probably a really bad idea. Um, in any case. In any case. <laughs> but uh, yeah, see-through is becoming more and more capable. Uh, probably two or three years from now, you'll probably have a flexible enough experience that you will prefer using a see-through headset than saying a phone or, or uh, anything else like that. Maybe even, actually even sooner than that. So like, for example, if I wanted to walk through the experience that you were showing me, I would definitely want to use a headset. I wouldn't want to use my phone. So I don't want to hold my hand up. Yeah. I want to be immersed into it. And then also the advantage of the headset is it does block some of the outside. So you're forced to kind of engage a little bit more in what, in what mm. you're seeing. So there's some benefits to not being able to see mm. your, your full 179 degree uh, uh, field of view. I'm, I'm definitely going to have to pick your brains on which platforms uh, we might or devices we might want to explore sort of the next iteration of this uh, tour on. Mm -hmm.
Um, there was a question that's been brewing for the last hour, but I didn't want to bring it up until late in the game, which is, you know, an embarrassing question for us that aren't business people. Um, that is, uh, does what? Where's the revenue? Who asked that? Michael, somebody. Uh, where's yeah. The so there's where's the revenue in, in VR. Yes. Where's the revenue in VR? In VR, yeah. And I and I answered some stuff online, but. Just, you know, we don't have to spend all evening on it, but if you have some thought, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, so to be clear, this project has zero revenue, a lot of negative revenue, in fact, that I'm trying to support through uh, applying to NSF and NEH grants together with my partners. Um, so that's an ongoing challenge. I will say that I mentioned that there's some opposition to the university to what we're going to what we're doing, but also other parts of the university have been very supportive. So um, we've received two internal grants um, on the order of about 30K each to get this started um, from a specific scholarship for interdisciplinary scholarship. Uh, and that's been just wonderful because it's supported the work of you know, my colleagues across different disciplines and students across dis different disciplines. Uh, if I were to speculate on where revenue could be made uh, through AR and VR gaming would be my first place that I would look. And so certainly if you think about the world's most popular AR experience like Pokemon Go, I think that's pretty well monetized. I haven't seen anything else that's really comparable. I know there are agencies that are doing some kind of branding work. And so we've actually looked at that as one source of inspiration for possible interaction possibilities that we can support in our tour. Um, most of those I would say are like one-off campaigns, you know, displaying, I don't know, the uh, Coke can on top of um, the Empire State Building or something like this. Um, and it has some like surprise value or um, novelty to get people to experience new things. Um, but I think that like long-term sustainable revenue source is something that the industry hasn't, hasn't found yet. So you just brought up games. And so I have to bring up, how do you expect people, will they get the whole story? How do they get the whole story? Why do they get the whole story? What motivates them to stay in it? You're talking about these kids. How are you going to interact with them? So why isn't this a game? Why aren't you thinking about the goals uh, and, and incentives and the structure of how you bring people through this curriculum? Or do, are you? Or does it matter? Not enough, I would say. So we started thinking about it. Right now, you know, we've been focused on what are the stories that tr the tribal elders have to share, but definitely increasing engagement um, is something that we're starting to think about and should think about more. Um, my instinct would be that there's kind of a careful line that we have to walk between trivializing the experience, if you will, um, and having the appropriate levers for engagement, um, which is something that the you know, serious storytelling or serious games community has worked on. Um, and so we're trying to learn from that. I have a colleague over uh, at uh, Midjourney who does actually, former colleague at Midjourney who does a lot of that kind of work and we're trying to pick his brains on you know, how we might add some sort of perhaps a collection element where you can collect different artifacts at different stops along the tour and deposit those into some sort of a uh, gallery or something that you have as you go through the tour. That's one possibility that we've started to explore, but I'm very open to other ideas um, here that others one, have. One more question uh, that came over was, um, what is the value of, um, high, of high resolution and photorealism? I, I, we kind of touched on that before. Um, so is it great to be perfect? You know, is it, should it be absolutely perfect or should it be separated from, from the physical world and obviously made as a, as, a, as a cartoon caricature or annotation of, that mm. tells the story, but isn't, isn't the uh, hut itself. Right. I mean, I think there are trade-offs. So the, um, realism can be, effective for um, like doing historical recreations and having people see what the environment would have really looked like uh, at a particular point in time. And so that's what we were going for, for the village stop in particular. But 
than we've also been imagining um, stops that have different objectives. So for instance, for a stop that tells the story of Ohlone cultural dance traditions, I think there, the realism, at least that I've seen so far um, through motion capture, ends up in this kind of uncanny valley of like, yeah, these are like kind of real-ish, but kind of awkward as well, not totally believable in the way at least um, people have been able to create these models so far. And so um, there, my inclination would actually be to go with something that is more abstract in terms of just like a form of the dances and having some particle effects um, where it's clear that we're not trying to do a photorealistic image of the dancers, but rather convey their motion and form in a way that's compelling. Um, so let's see, our, um, I think we've kind of uh, gone through everybody's questions. Um, ah, Edwin had one more. Sparked by the one that you, this is Edwin, sorry. Uh, sparked by the one just before your last one. Um, I think for me, this this brings me to a question of like, what does success in in terms of their stories? What does that mean for the the Ohlone voices? Is it more people hearing their stories? Is it more people learning their language? Um, I guess that's a so, success look like. Yeah, what Absolutely. does success look like for them? Yeah, so I think there's both like what is the message they want to communicate. And how and who can we reach? Um, you know, which audiences can we reach with that message? Um, and so I think it was interesting when we started out the project. Our inclination had been to really lean into the history, the untold dark history of the site. And then when we started collaborating with them, they really wanted to include that, but prioritize or emphasize the "we are still here" message. That is not just that we are historical peoples, but also that we are still here in this community as students at this university um, and still practicing our dance traditions at the powwow here every year. Uh, and so on the messaging side, we really worked to figure out what was the right stories to communicate in the first place. And then in terms of reach, uh, they're fighting for um, recognition. They're not a federally recognized um, tribe. And so then, I think building community recognition, recognition with uh, official stakeholders or lobbying the um, San Jose City Council to give them uh, some recognition. So they're very excited when we can also use this medium as a vehicle to bring like news media to campus to cover the tour like you saw in that clip. Um, and uh, then you know educate future generations of fourth graders about this part of history so that they grow up knowing that this is, this is a part of it. Nice. Um, so what I heard you say, and I, I was thinking it too, was that what people want is to feel understood and to feel good about themselves. And, and you know, here, here you're giving them a platform to say you have a history and they can, they can uh, you know, enjoy that, uh, that they have a history and they have a, a presence and a, rea you know, and a, and a, and a righteous uh, belonging. 100%. I would say, yeah, and it's not just the outcome of the project, it's also the process. So um, as part of this, we are also using some of our funds and grant funds to support traditional cultural activities. So every year we do a youth camp on campus that brings together the youth from the tribe from across California to campus here to engage in uh, this, this year it was basket weaving. Um, the previous year it was making shell necklaces. Um, and the elders are there telling them stories of the, the tribe. Uh, and so supporting, and you know, we did the recording of the songs and so supporting those activities and then creating a Chochenyo language version requires them to practice their Chochenyo. So that process, regardless of you know, how many people ultimately end up uh, watching you know, the Chochenyo language version in the app holds value in of itself for the tribe. So um, with that, I think I'm gonna just uh, tell, tell you guys all you know, fantastic, talk. Thank you very much for, for uh, giving it.